This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. There are few greater delights than to go back three or four hundred years and become, in fancy at least, an Elizabethan. That such fancies are only fancies, that this becoming an Elizabethan, this reading sixteenth-century writing as currently and certainly as we read our own, is an illusion, is no doubt true. Very likely the Elizabethans would find our pronunciation of their language unintelligible. Our fancy picture of what it pleases us to call Elizabethan life would rouse their ribald merriment. Still, the instinct that drives us to them is so strong, and the freshness and vigour that blow through their pages are so sweet, that we willingly run the risk of being laughed at, of being ridiculous. And if we ask why we go further astray in this particular region of English literature than in any other, the answer is no doubt that Elizabethan prose, for all its beauty and bounty, was a very imperfect medium. It was almost incapable of fulfilling one of the offices of prose, which is to make people talk simply and naturally about ordinary things. In an age of utilitarian prose like our own, we know exactly how people spend the hours between breakfast and bed, how they behave when they are neither one thing nor the other, neither angry nor loving, neither happy nor miserable. Poetry ignores these slighter shades. The social student can pick up hardly any facts about daily life from Shakespeare's plays. And if prose refuses to enlighten us, then one avenue of approach to the men and women of another age is blocked. Elizabethan prose, still scarcely separated off from the body of its poetry, could speak magnificently, of course, about the great themes, how life is short and death certain how spring is lovely and winter horrid. Perhaps, indeed, the lavish and towering periods that it raises above these simple platitudes are due to the fact that it has not cheapened itself upon trifles. But the price it pays for this soaring splendour is to be found in its awkwardness when it comes to earth. When Lady Sidney, for example, finding herself cold at nights, has to solicit the Lord Chamberlain for a better bedroom at court. Then any housemaid of her own age could put her case more simply and with greater force. Thus, if we go to the Elizabethan prose writers to solidify the splendid world of Elizabethan poetry, as we should go now to our biographers, novelists and journalists, to solidify the world of Pope, of Tennyson, of Conrad, we are perpetually baffled and driven from our quest. What, we ask, was the life of an ordinary man or woman in the time of Shakespeare. Even the familiar letters of the time give us little help. Sir Henry Wooden is pompous and ornate, and keeps us stiffly at arm's length. Their histories resound with drums and trumpets, their broadsheets reverberate with meditations upon death and reflections upon the immortality of the soul. Our best chance of finding them off their guard and so becoming at ease with them, is to seek one of those unambitious men who haunt the outskirts of famous gatherings, listening, observing, sometimes taking a note in a book. But they are difficult to find. Gabriel Harvey, perhaps, the friend of Spencer and of Sidney, might have fulfilled that function. Unfortunately, the values of the time persuaded him that to write about rhetoric, to write about Thomas Smith, to write about Queen Elizabeth in Latin was better worth doing than to record the table talk of Spencer and Sir Philip Sidney. But he possessed, to some extent, the modern instinct for preserving trifles, for keeping copies of letters, and for making notes of ideas that struck him in the margins of books. If we rummage among these fragments, we shall, at any rate, leave the high road and perhaps hear some roar of laughter from a tavern door where poets are drinking, or meet humble people going about their milking and their love-making, without a thought that this is the great Elizabethan age, or that Shakespeare is at this moment strolling down the strand, and might tell one, if one plucked him by the sleeve, to whom he wrote the sonnets, and what he meant by Hamlet. <laughs>